Okay, we are now recording. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, uh, presentation on sources of capital for pet care startups. I uh, hope you are all in the right space. Um, uh, my name is Asad Bhatt. I'm the Director of Ventures and Partnerships at Kinship. We'll get into what Kinship is. I've also invited here today uh, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Ben Bungert, uh, from Learn Launch Accelerator Program in Boston. And Ben's there Hello. in the window as well. Um, I wanted him because I feel like on these calls you always hear from me and people within the LEAP network and I thought maybe bringing an outsider, someone who has experience with investing and in, uh, accelerator programs and, and other things would be very beneficial and so um, we'll, we'll ask Ben to do a little bit of an introduction in just a second. Um, uh, high level uh, um, what's going to happen today? We're going to just we have a bunch of slides that we can go through. It'll probably be 20 or 30 minutes of a presentation, but we really want this to be interactive. So please ask questions in, in, in the window and let, um, you know, let's make this a, a conversation. Uh, we'll likely, because of the number of people we are up to 26 right now, we'll probably have you muted the entire time and the session is being recorded. We might uh, unmute you if you have a specific, specific question or comment or, or something like that. Um, and so before we get started, a little bit about LEAP. Um, so LEAP is a partnership between two organizations, uh, uh, Kinship and Michelson Found Animals. We are basically here to support early stage pet care entrepreneurs, uh, presumably like most of you that are joining. Um, we've been around for about three and a half, four years. Um, and we're one of the first programs that really was uh, designed to ignite meaningful growth across the pet care ecosystem. We have two uh, main programs, uh, our Leap Venture Academy, which this webinar is a part of. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, sorry. I got a phone call and got connected. Um, so for Live Venture Academy, we do things like webinars, workshops, meetups. We do pitch competition. We had a pitch competition just last month where we awarded, uh, awarded $25,000 in prize money to three startups. Uh, we're doing a boot camp in a couple of weeks for female and uh, people of color founders. Uh, all this programming in Live Venture Studio is free. We have a Slack group that you should be a part of. Um, and then we run our premier Leap Venture Studio program, which is our investment vehicle for early stage pet care founders. Um, we do one cohort per, per year. We bring in, uh, you know, six to seven to eight startups. This year it'll be virtual um, in February, uh, starting in February, and we invest up to 200K in investment. We just opened up applications yesterday. Um, so if you are a pet care uh, startup, you're welcome to apply. Um, applications op are open until the middle of October. So uh, apply early and apply often, no, just apply once and it doesn't matter when you apply. Um, Isabel, you on? Um, you wanna share a little bit about Michelson Found Animals? Yeah, um, so Michelson Found Animals is an animal welfare nonprofit based in Los Angeles um, and they operate a wide range of programs from social enterprises like our adopt and shop um, shelter location philanthropic investments um, through LEAP and through other programs. And then we have strategic initiatives in Los Angeles um, around housing and homelessness um, and how that affects pet owners um, and keeps pets um, and their parents apart. Cool. And yeah, this is a little bit more about our offerings, but um, we're happy to be a, a, a LEAP partner and um, the website is a great way to learn more about Michelson Found Animals. And then I, as I mentioned before, I work for Kinship, which is a division of Mars Pet Care. We're really um, focusing on building uh, new uh, products and services focused on uh, pet parents, uh, servicing pet parents across the country, across the world. Um, we are a division of Mars Pet Care, which is one of the, uh, I think, the world's leading pet nutrition and healthcare company. We have uh, five huge brands um, in our portfolio and, and dozens of others. And um, I love this stat. We... 60% uh, of the dogs and cats in the developed world are fed by our products. Um, and so a lot of um, um, uh, expertise uh, in this world. So today, uh, the call, we're really talking about uh, sources of capital for pet care founders. And um, as I mentioned before, we really want this to be a discussion. I've 
we put together some slides to kind of lead the discussion and happy to go in any direction that you want. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, my partner in crime for this conversation is Ben Bungert from Learn Launch Accelerator in Boston. Ben, you want to give a little bit of background? Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, so my, my caveat is that uh, I am in, in education. I am not in uh, <laughs> in pet care or pet tech, um, but uh, Asad and I used to were were colleagues formerly um, at at his at his former accelerator job, um, and so I do this just on the other side with a different industry. Um, so I'm going to uh, join in to provide uh, a different but similar opinion, or at least just say yes, Asad, that's exactly correct. Everything you're saying is right, which is what he just wants me to do. Um, <laughs> I'm not at all. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, so uh, I work at Learn Launch Accelerator. We are an ed tech accelerator in Boston. Uh, we're both a, a fund um, and, a, and an accelerator, an educational accelerator program. I've uh, been there about four years now um, uh, and have focused on specifically education companies that are in the um, pre-seed to early seed range. So have revenue in market um, and support them through everything from entering the market working on their sales uh, playbook, fundraising, you name it. Um, so I'm excited to, to, uh, to meet you all, um, to hear what Saad has to say, uh, to contribute where appropriate, um, and uh, it'll be fun. Yeah, and also Ben is uh, from Boston, lives in Boston, went to school in Boston, and that's a huge startup community. And so um, it, he knows a lot of what's going on in that area. And there's, you know, investors, accelerators, all that kind of stuff. So definitely if you have questions along those lines, um, you know, let us know, we can go, go down that path. Um, and Dylan Boyd, our, uh, the, our lead venture studio director was going to join as well, but I don't see him on just yet. So he might join and, and ping and, or, or share his expertise and opinions as well. So uh, I think we will just start with, and again, if you have questions, chime, chime in. Um, We'll start with uh, types of funding, and and I think uh, as a disclaimer, I think you know I, I think this is going to cover you know every assuming that people aren't or haven't raised yet, um, or uh, or maybe you're starting the process or have tried and failed, and so um, I there some of the stuff might be very basic, um, but it's just foundational. I think the other caveat is um, on all this kind of stuff. It's it's just you know, uh, um, it depends, you know, everything depends, in fundraising, everything depends on who you are, who you know, where you're at. Um, none of this is, uh, um, uh, yeah, this is just advice and, and, and information from, from experience uh, that both Ben and I uh, have had in the last, you know, 10 years of doing this kind of stuff. Um, so different types of funding that I think uh, are, Pet care founders and startups uh, um, can access. So, you know, at a very basic level, especially at the early stage, grants and non dilutive capital are, are probably some of the best things that you can go after. Um, and when when I discuss when I say this here, you know, there are things like pitch competitions that we run, crowdfunding uh, um, uh, online, and government grants. I think uh, in Ben's world, government grants are probably more applicable. Um, ben, what do you think about the grants and non-dilutive uh, capital on the yeah. government door? Yeah, for I think for all early stage companies, this is the way this is the way to success. Um, I think everyone's always looking toward VC or some sort of sexy funding. Um, but honestly, this the the, the non-dilutive, the going to your local um, the university you went to, do they have do they have an accelerator that gives uh, ten thousand dollar prototyping grants uh, for for free? Right, totally just. Uh, uh, non-dilutive funding um, that you can use in whatever way you want. If you're an alumni or a faculty member or have someone on your team that's associated, like there's lots of different ways of sort of contorting it so that you, <laughs> you have access. I ran the uh, accelerator at Northeastern in, in Boston um, and we have uh, 400 different companies um, that, that have access to $300,000 in grant funding. So that's an example of uh, a startup ecosystem that, that um, is, is funding in small bits, um, prototyping, uh, and then pitch is absolutely right. That's a great place to get five, 10, 15, $20,000 to test if this is real. Um, and we'll talk about why testing it to see if it's real is great before you go and think you're, you're going to raise some sort of institutional round. 
The next, thank you, Ben. The next thing um, that a lot of startups uh, go after is convertible um, instruments. And so convertible notes at a high level, essentially what they are, are uh, investors saying, we don't know the value of your company, uh, but we want it, we, we believe in what you're doing and we want to give you a certain amount of money um, and it will convert to shares in the company at a later date when we both agree, you know, uh, on on the value of the company at that later time, it's a it's um, it's a way to to cut through some of the legal um, craziness that happens with funding startups at an early age. Um, uh, so there's convertible notes, and then there's safe instruments. And safe instruments are uh, were popularized by I believe Y Combinator. Is that right, Ben? Um, and it it's basically a one page document um, that's become or a couple pages maybe that's become popular. Um, uh, and again, just a way for you to get early capital in, in the money, in, in the early capital in your company, um, uh, um, so you can build. Ben, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, no, just like there. Add something if I may. Oh, was there a question? Go ahead. No, no, I do. I just want to add something if I may, as I Sure. Andres. Yeah, please. Yeah, um, I, Beloped has already raised $100,000 last year, and we used the SAFE uh, mechanism because it's very attractive for investors, especially in early stages. And it, uh, it actually helps you to build that relationship of trust while maybe you don't know, you don't have everything so clear on how to do things with investors. So it helps you to develop a very trustful relationship. And after that, if you do that well, and in the conversion date or negotiate uh, at the end. So I would advise that for a lot of early companies, especially with very innovative ideas. Right, we lost you there a little bit, but I think we got the gist of what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and I've also, we've also seen startups that have done a couple convertible notes in a row because they're still trying to figure things out. Um, and that, that seems to be you know, a, a path forward um, for sure. Um, equity or, you know, rounds or types of funding are, are essentially what you see, you know, most VC firms are doing is, is they are investing capital in you for a certain percentage of your company. Um, and, and you might hear, you know, series A, seed plus rounds, priced rounds, they're all a form of equity where, where essentially you are giving up control, a little bit of control, a little bit of ownership um, in your company. And then debt is the is the final category, um, and so that could be loans. It could be you put stuff on your credit card. It could be something from a bank. Um, so just various types of funding. I, I, I wonder if um, if people want to put in the chat window. Has anybody uh, other than Andreas uh, raised any money on, on or brought in any money uh, into their company? That they any stories that they want to share? Ben, while we're waiting, I want to talk about what Learn Launch does in terms yeah. of investing in startups? For sure. Um, the other thing that just to note, and, and I think this is important for early stage companies, especially ones that are not typically VC fundable or, or sort of hyper growth, so they won't, they won't go a traditional investor route. Um, the SBA has a lot of funding op options for, for early stage companies, um, and they fund lots of different ty types of companies. So um, I would think about putting that in your back pocket is they do loans, they do some grants, they do lots of different things. So something to another thing to, to look at in terms of the, the, the loan route. What was that again? Um, Can you say that again? Uh, the, the SBA, Small Business. Oh, Small Business Administration. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're known for a lot of different things, but I think people don't necessarily call out the fact that they, they are, they, they do um, support with, with capital. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so Learn Launch, we, um, again, we invest pretty, pretty early in the sort of revenue stage of a company. And typically we will invest with common stock. And I don't know, Asad, if um, uh, I didn't see it on here, but we do spend, we do spend most of our time or used to spend most of our time um, with very, with pretty early stage, early revenue stage companies investing comments or investing using common stock. So we would essentially um, for $20,000 take um, a percent of common stock and there's different types of there's common and there's preferred and typically if you're seeing any sort any sort of equity um, usually convertible usually safe they're gonna that will convert to a preferred spot on the cap table 
common stock is more like founder shares. So you're sort of bringing early advisors in, you're bringing in friends and family, you're bringing in whatever, and essentially throwing them on, on mostly on the side of the cap table that you're on. Um, so they come in sort of like your family. Um, so typically learn lunch is on that side of the cap table and we're sort of in early low dollars for a high percentage um, that gets diluted really quickly when you're raising follow on capital. And as soon as you start adding um, preferred investors that that percent certainly goes down. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll do a mix of things. Usually it's either fully common stock. So we'll do five or 6% common stock for the, for the investment and the, and the mentorship and the network and the sort of follow on services and all of that stuff, sort of like your anchor tenant as a, a your anchor friend, your anchor family. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll do a follow on round typically with a convertible note. We do, we've done safe suit on kisses. We've done lots of different types of things. Um, typically a convertible note is easiest for us and, and the thing that most of our companies are raising on and specifically in education. And, um, aside, you can, you can say if this is the same in, in pet care, um, is, is like he said before, I think this is important to note is, is, you know, you you see sort of like the pre-seed and then the seed and then the seed plus and the series A and then the series B. And it just seems very cut and dry. And what we find in education is that before a company gets to a formal seed round, they'll probably have three or four pre-seed rounds, right? So they're going to raise 200,000 here, they're going to raise 400,000 there, they're going to raise another 400 or a bridge, a couple hundred thousand, and then they're going to go for their seed. Um, and so it just takes a little while. So typically we'll invest in convertible note because that just makes it easier for the early stage capital to come in in different, in different sort of rounds. Um, the challenge there is that the more people you add, the more complicated your cap table is, the more, and then people come in at different valuations at different times and it can get really messy. And, and so anyway, so it's just something it's to keep in mind, but typically we'll do, we'll do convertible note. And now we're just starting to do a mixture of warrants um, and, uh, and convertible notes. So uh, these are all very different things, but essentially a warrant is like a, a little bit of a, um, a sweetener that says that uh, we can we can set aside a certain number of shares that we can purchase at a specific price at a, at a certain point in the future, um, and that price is locked in, right? So if, if, if the price for share is a dollar, now we can lock that price in, whereas the price will be there. So just a different way of um, sort of ensuring your place in terms of return from an investor perspective. And it's a great way to sweeten the pot if you're, if you're looking to bring people in um, from, the, from, the, from the entrepreneur's perspective. Thanks, Ben. That's great. Um, Barbara had a question. Do you, you need to work with an attorney for the convertible debt and safe notes? I, I, I definitely think that anytime you're taking in money, you definitely have an, uh, a lawyer look at it. I, I, I don't think that they should be charging you necessarily to create those docs. You can find them for free, you know, online. And I think YC probably has a link and, and whatnot. So, you know, if they're charging you to create those and that's probably not right, but certainly have someone look over the terms. Uh, and yeah. I think that investors will expect you to spend some of the money that you're, that they're investing uh, on legal. Um, and so that should be, you know, built into, to the, the amount that you're raising for sure. Um, I'm just going to go to the next slide while we're talking about um, uh, answering other questions. So, so Scott, yeah, we talked about, do you recommend any other non-dilutive government grants? Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that there, I, um, I don't know enough in the pet care space uh, to know if there are government grants available. The ones that I think are more available are uh, from foundations or you know nonprofits that are are um, um, yeah giving you know giving grants away. Um, typically, though, they go to nonprofits, and but I have seen some that go to you know go to for profit as well. Um, I wonder if we could collectively create a list of 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 places that uh, are are friendly. Um, are the JSBIRs? They don't they don't service any sort of pet care or pet tech. That I'm not. I don't think so. I'm not aware. I just lost all the access to the the chat. I apologize. Uh, one second. Well, maybe uh, Isabella or Ben, you can read out the questions. I I uh, apologize. Shh. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, just in, in terms of uh, time, I want to kind of go through this and then we can go, go to questions. So in terms of the investors that we're seeing, you know, active in the space, you know, high level friends and family and crowdfunding and angels is where a lot of early stage founders start. Um, they're the easiest ones that, that um, you're going to get to write 
um, checks into your uh, into your startup. Angel groups and accelerator programs are probably the next level. Um, just from what I've seen, uh, um, typically you have to have a product in market with revenue and with traction to get those um, um, people interested or those those groups interested. Um, syndicates, corporate strategics, and venture funds are typically for companies that have proven uh, product market fit, have a significant amount of revenue, and are scaling um, pretty high. We'll go a little bit deeper into this in, in just a second. Um, you know, in terms of financing your startup, I think the biggest thing is kind of knowing what you are um, as a company. And I think this is where a lot of startups uh, um, uh, uh, fail in, in terms of their fundraising strategy. Uh, we have a lot of, we see a lot of startups that are not venture backable company, but are going after venture capital. Um, ben, do you want to comment on that? I feel like you've probably seen a lot, a lot of that. Sorry, can you say the question again? I was responding to someone in the chat. <laughs> no, no worries. It's, it's the idea of, of knowing what you are when you're going for funding. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that if, I, if I'm interpreting the question, the, the, the comment correctly, I think the, the thing that we see a lot of our companies do is they go, um, they talk to the, I'm going to keep words, using the word sexy because it makes people uncomfortable, but it, <laughs> but it also does call out the, the reality of the situation, right? And I think that's a lot of what startups are is like, what's is, you know, what's the most attractive uh, group you can go to? And we find a lot of our companies, there are a, a significant number of series A investors in, in ed tech in the US. And we find all of our companies, even if they haven't raised a seed round, are like jonesing to talk to them. Um, they 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 think that they're just the, they're the path, and they maybe they'll make maybe they'll get a million dollars by chance, and it's just not the case. They're going to invest in three or four, maybe five companies a year, and they're not going to be that company. So I think it's more of a, a making the hit list of you know who based on where you're at, what's based on the stage you're at, and what you're and what kind of company you're building. Who, were, who is interested in investing in you, right? We've built out a list of all of the ed tech investors in the US that are, in, at, that are institutional investors and every single one plays a part in a specific place. Some are impact investors, so they're gonna care about double, double bottom line. They're gonna care about um, returns to the community um, more than anything else. And that's, you have to report on that and you have to, it has to be in your mission statement. It has to be sort of driven by everything you do. Um, and then, so there's sort of like vertical specific stuff, like the kind of, solution you're providing as well as the stage stuff so if you look at it sort of as a matrix of where's your sweet spot how far along are you in building the company and then what kind of company are you and what types of investors fit there so in education there's there's early childhood there's k-12 there's higher ed, there's workforce and so where in those on along those four uh, on the, along those four lines do you do you sit and then how far along are you and then there's going to be a square of investors that sort of fit there too um oftentimes like a um like Assad said, the angels and angel groups are your best bet. There's a lot, a lot more sort of like hunting to find the right person who cares, um, but it's easier capital and there's a lot more of them. Um. Agreed, yeah. And it, uh, we break up uh, the type of company you are into social venture cap company, a normal growth, a lifestyle company, high growth and extreme growth. And I think, mm. as I mentioned before, the, the, the big thing is that most startups are not venture backable, but there are, there is capital out there for the type of company you are. It's, it's all about trying to find out who are those investors that are um, uh, interested in the type of business that you're, you're building. Um, uh, and, in, and taking in investment is all about, lowering risk for the potential investor. And so uh, things that, that investors want to see, regardless of who they are, that you've invested uh, in your own capital or in, and time into your company, that you were able to convince friends and family to invest. If, if uh, I think it's a strong signal of your ability to pitch and uh, uh, whether you know, your friends and family kind of believe in what you're doing. Um, whether you're good with cash. An example, <laughs> I was talking with a startup here in Portland a couple of years ago, and uh, we were going to a co-working space and she had lost her her access card to get in and or left it at home or something like that. And um, and like just just put uh, you know the charge of like 25 bucks uh, to get a new card on on her credit card and was like, okay, let's let's keep on going. And for me, that was like all right, if she's just spending kind of 25 bucks because she forgot something at home, that's a, a signal that like she might not be spending cash wisely. 
Um, and, and you're also very stage. stingy, Asad. So you know. <laughs> I am, but you know, at an early stage, you got to be super stingy. Uh, uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, and that's just an N of yes. one, right? Yes. Um, the ability to publicize and hit milestones. Uh, we, I've asked, you know, whenever I talk to startups, and probably a lot of you've heard me say, you know, sit, keep me on your monthly updates. Let me know what those milestones are, because we love to see the ability for you to to say what you're going to do and then hit them or tell us why you're not hitting them and, and, yeah. and whatnot. That's, um, a, that's a big one. We, we encourage all of our companies to build a monthly reporting or some cadence that's regular quarterly, monthly, something like that, where you're updating on the same five or six things. Um, and, and, sh and if we're going to be honest, investors, most investors, uh, we have 71 companies. So if we were to get 71 every month, I promise you wouldn't read them. Um, but the, there is uh, there is honestly a signaling event happening when when you're getting that in email in your inbox. You're sort of like checking off, okay, that company sent me one, that company sent me one. And if you're getting one, typically that means that they're, things are going pretty well or they're pretty sort of status quo. Um, if people aren't sending, they were sending them and they're not anymore, that tends to be a bad sign. And there's almost always like a uh, something that happens three months down the line. We're like, hey, by the way, we're closing down. Um, we've, we've seen that happen so many times. And so like, and then, and so, so one, the cadence is really important, the sort of recurring nature. And then the other thing is to think about the, the sort of social capital you're building by including people and having something that you're always updating and bringing new mentors into and asking people, oh, hey, you're a sort of advisor or, or an angel investor uh, that seems to, seems to be interested in what I'm working on. Can I add you to my investor list or to my, to my advisor, mentor, friend of the family list? And you'd be surprised how often people would reach back out and say, hey, sounds like you're doing some really interesting stuff. Let's talk. Um, we hear from our companies all the time. That's exactly right, Ben. Um, Thank you, Asad. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the ability to uh, to attract a team, and at an early stage, a lot of times that team is uh, a set of advisors or or mentors that you have on on that slide, um, and so you know that that helps to lower the risk. And then also having a non complex business structure. We see I've seen startups at times have like you know multiple LLCs. You know, uh, in just you know the simpler that it is, the 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 easier it is for for people to put money in, and less you'll pay in legal fees. Um, this is a slide that uh, Ben and I, as former partner, put together in terms of the type we of think. funding that's out there. We think, yeah, we actually, we actually don't know. We're just not she stole it from someone else. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I think that this kind of uh, talks about the different types of people that can give you funding. And I think a lot of times people primarily focus on the upper right, which is the traditional VC. And as Ben mentioned, you know, uh, they're looking at thousands of deals to make, you know, three to five max a year investments. And so the odds are pretty slim, uh, you know, that you get, get funding from them. Um, and then the truth of the matter is because of the state of the world, unfortunately, the odds are if you are a woman or a person of color, it's even lower, um, you know, and so what are the other vehicles out there that, that um, or people that are willing to fund what you're doing? So um, I'll, I'm going to keep jumping. I'm just going to keep jumping in as things pop up. I back. love it. Yeah, so that, please. So, please. While the, so, so Assad is absolutely right. Obviously, we've seen stats about 3% of female founded companies are there because that's are abysmal um, for people of color and, and women founders. That said, I do, I do think, and we've seen our company, our companies have a lot of success with this, is if you fit into one of those parameters or group, we'll call them groups, um, uh, it is a lot easier to find sort of your home of people who are only investing in you. Um, so sure, maybe the traditional funding routes, they're, you know, if, they're, if, a, com if a, a traditional VC fund right now is investing in five companies, chances are, the majority of those companies are going to be white men and, and we're working on that, right? That's an active thing. We're, that's something we're actively changing in the industry um, because it's clearly unacceptable. Um, but the sort of cropping up of um, minority, owned, minority owned business founder funds um, and female founder funds are immense. Um, uh, Chloe Capital for, for uh, women, female founders, uh, Pipeline Angels for female founders, uh, golden seeds for female like, like there's so many of these different things that are popping up that are very specific and that uh, obviously that means that you know there's <laughs> a lot more people are, are applying to them because it is so specific and it's and in the competition just becomes higher because the the, the, the parameters are all are, are, are sort of a little more boiled down um uh they obviously have stage requirements but 
but as long as you sort of meet that you have a female founder on your co-founding team, then you're, you're kind of like <laughs> set to talk to them. Um, but it also means you can, you can sort of, you know, the, there are, are articles upon articles of the, of the, of the funds that are that sort of cater to specific groups of people um, to try and make it easier for those folks who are typically left out of funding cycles to find it easier. Pam, Pam asked this question, how do you find the types of investors that may be a good fit for you? And then uh, I think it's Hector from PECNAC. Good, good start is to review the investment criteria for the investors' websites. I think, you know, I think finding companies that are similar to yours that have gotten funding and you can go on AngelList and, and other places or even Google them to see who's invested in them. Um, I think starting locally with your local angel groups in town and um, is also great. Uh, now in the age of COVID with everybody taking meetings virtually, I feel like investors are more accessible than they were before. And, and honestly, it's a numbers game. Um, you know, uh, I, I, it's not um, unsurprising to hear um, startup founders spending 30 to 40 hours a week just trying to network and communicate with potential investors. And, and I think it's a, you know, you have to talk to 100 to get one to commit um, type of thing. And, you know, some people will be more successful and some people will be less successful, but um, it takes time. I think another great place to find investors um, is, is on Twitter um, and social media. There, there, there are a bunch of people that are quite active and, um, you know, follow them. Uh, I've seen people, I've seen a lot of investors offer up office hours during uh, COVID. Um, and so, you know, again, it's, it's starting that conversation. It's, uh, it's going in asking for advice and built, as Ben mentioned, getting them onto your mailing list update and then um, uh, asking for investment when the time is right. Yeah. The, the other thing to think about is, thinking about multipliers, who are the people or the organizations that are going to get, get you access to, or at least have the information about the right, your industry. Um, and obviously this is a great place to start. Um, in Boston, we have this organization, the capital network, um, and they do fundraising education for startups. Um, they're, they are not the only one in the country. There are certainly others. Um, and what they do in addition to classes on what are 409 A's and, and cap tables and, whatever um they do running office hours with investors right so uh, members who are participating in the organization have every month have access to new angel investors or new investors in the community um and it's just a great way to get to get in front of folks to to, to learn the lingo to learn how they think um to maybe meet someone by chance that that's interesting right the reason they're participating as mentors or coaches is because their angel investors are also looking for the sort of those places that are multipliers for them to find as many people as possible um, without having to sort of go out and, and look on the internet or whatever, right? Like where are, the, where are these people convening that's easy, that makes it easier for them to find you and you to find them? Um, that's not, again, not revolutionary, but I think people are kind of like, where do I look? And it's like, well, who's supporting startups in, in their fundraising journey, right? Um, accelerators are great places to go for that. Uh, so, are, so are other nonprofits that are more community-based that are bringing the right people together to, to force the, communication, your local venture capital association, um, the, the one in New England, they do a lot of sort of pairing um, a couple times a year. They do a, a healthcare um, unpitch where the investors sort of sit back and listens to the, um, to the entrepreneur present to them. And, and they're more like, oh, that's interesting. And then there's follow-up meetings after that. And so it's, there's lots of different types of things out there that will get you in sort of a, in front of a critical mass of investors and just start to get your sort of clause in there. It does seem like a bunch of you have raised some amount of money, which is awesome. So, um, but for those of you that are, that are new to this, um, something to think about. And we, we are trying at Leap to, to be that connector as much as we can. And, and um, <clears throat> through our programming and whatnot, we're trying to bring more and more people to connect with startups. Um, other people in the industry that are doing, if you haven't already checked out the Pecker Innovation Prize, and their network, um, the Nestle Purina people, I think they're doing some cool things and connecting um, uh, with people. And I definitely think you should, as Ben mentioned, look at accelerator programs or incubator programs because there's a they're a great way to to build that network um, at an early stage for sure. Um, this is just something that I kind of uh, uh, put together um, based on my two years in this field and kind of what I'm seeing in, uh, in terms of uh, who's funding what at what stage. Um, and so we get a lot, as I mentioned, we get a lot of people at Leap and at our companion fund through Mars coming to us where they're just not there yet. Uh, you know, typically 
um, um, people, uh, people I think are always uh, asking a stage ahead of where they are right now. <laughs> That's generally kind of, um, which isn't a bad thing. Um, it's great to start building those relationships. But, you know, if you were at the idea stage, it's very hard to, to get a check from a, a venture capitalist because it's just, unless you've, you have, uh, you know, expertise or uh, have, have done it before, um, yeah, it, it's very, or it's you're very in Silicon hard. Valley or if you're, you're giving anybody money. Yeah. It's just, it's, <laughs> but these are the exceptions. Um, hey, Asad. Yeah. On this slide is the typical amount. Is that the investment amount or is that the revenue requirement? Oh, that's a, sorry. No, that's the investment amount. Um, the round size, I, you know, I, I have a, I, I think later on, I kind of, um, uh, this slide is, is very, um, that's great quality, uh, Asad. Blurry, yeah, I, I apologize. I, I took a picture of, of something else, of this. Um, and so this this top um, um, row is uh, MRR, monthly recurring revenue. And so, you know, this, I broke it down, you know, early revenue companies that are doing anywhere to $15,000 a month in recurring revenue. You know, they're typically going out for anywhere from zero to 500K in revenue. And I, you know, we're calling that a seed round, but it could be a pre-seed, it could be a C plus. And typically, you know, they're having success with friends and family, angel, angel groups, pre-seed investors and accelerator programs. Um, and then I just put down how we can help. And so, you know, we try our best to help startups and, you know, in each of these categories, I can send this around afterwards. Yeah. I like um, this aside. This is really helpful. This is a really cool slide. Would you mind? Oh, if, if you oh, of course. That? Yeah, yeah. yeah this, totally. This and, cool. and this is just like at a, you know, like, Again, you could you could ha be at an idea stage and get yeah. four million it's not dollars just because. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's not formulaic. Um, so the one thing I, the one thing I'll throw out here too is just that I think everything's sort of gravy until you reach Series A. So if you're talking about the sort of traditional Series A investors, they have a I mean they have like a you have to have a million dollars in revenue or I'm not even going to talk to you rule. Not always, but a lot of them do have that rule because they're just flooded with people who aren't there yet. Even if you have $500,000 in recurring revenue, which might seem like a lot and seem like you're chugging along, you definitely are, but they're not ready for you because it's not repeatable. I think that the key here for Series A is repeatable. You have a, and the, the thing we always say is until you, until you understand the sort of math problem of um, if I hire this many people and I pump this much money into the organization and they do this, these three things, then my revenue, you know, this much investment will equal this much revenue. And we have the formula for how we get there. And until you have that, and you can explain it to an investor, you're not ready for a series A and they're not going to entertain what you're saying. Um, everything before that is kind of gravy. Um, not exactly, but like, it's a lot more malleable at that point. Um, so just something to think about, especially as you go from like early revenue to revenue, because once companies sort of hit the revenue stage, they're like, I've got 500 to a million dollars in revenue, and I'm ready to go raise a series A. And it's like, you're about to be there. Um, but that's a great time to start talking to those investors because that becomes interesting for them. Um, but just something to think about where, where things get difficult is that sort of million to million and a half, at least in education, but all of our numbers are scaled down because education is hard and horrible. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it's that dissimilar from, from tech chain. And then I think the, the one caveat to this is, as well is um, a lot of the science or pharma or biotech stuff within Tech care, like clearly that needs a lot of funding, um, you know, just to get to the um, uh, to the revenue stage, and so that's a that's a different um, model altogether, um, and different set of funders and, and whatnot, and um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so okay, so how much to raise? Typically, we ask we 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 tell people to plan for twelve to eighteen months worth of uh, runway, and again, it should be milestone based. So you know, whatever whether it's X amount of revenue or a certain product launch, you know, you should really be approaching investors with you'll be spending this money to get to this point. Um, uh, and then I forgot why I put risk return. Um, oh, I think it all just uh, it it's it's about how much risk you're willing to 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 take and what what the return is for them, uh, for the investors uh, afterwards. And then I recommend just look at comparable. So we see a lot of startups that have, you know, done the research and they say, okay, the, this direct to consumer company raised 500 K before they got their product, um, you know, in the market. And, and so that's a, that's a good, you know, good way to kind of think through how much you should be raising as well. Um, give or take. Ben thoughts. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the the runway thing is 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 <laughs> that's ideal, and you're going to find the reason that we talk about people raising multiple pre seed rounds is because they plan ahead, and then everything goes to hell, um, and they have to raise a bridge round to make it that twelve to eighteen months, right? So I think that you know if you're in the earliest stages, if you haven't raised any money, if you've just raised a little bit. Um, you may want you may want to adjust that or really understand you know maybe only a hundred thousand dollars does get you twelve to eighteen months right but expect that that does change um, and expect that that because you don't have a repeatable a repeatable model and you're still figuring this out and still the, you're still pumping the product into the market and pulling it back and testing it that that stuff may change and that you're going to realize that you raised two hundred thousand dollars and something goes right and then that only lasts you six months and then you're back fundraising as soon as you close the round right like all these things are subject to change but yeah. You should shoot for 12 to 18 months, but <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> uh, Diane says for researching comparables, what other source besides Crunchbase do you use? How do you find what milestones other startups set for a similar raise in the same space? Um, honestly, I, I would say talk to other founders and we have a bunch of founders that are willing to share their stories and how much they've, they've raised uh, before. Um, we, I don't compile any of that data, but if, you know, I, I'm happy to, to, to try to do some digging and give you some examples or, you know, high level, without using the names of the companies, uh, high level, you know, uh, um, but I, you know, I think generally in terms of numbers or, you know, I think for some reason people really like round numbers. And so we're seeing people, you know, do a friends and family round of 250 to 500 K or, you know, the next round, a seed round of 750 to 1.5 million. Um, uh, I think at, at an early stage, you know, you might even go down to 100K, you know, to, to prove out a milestone uh, to get to that next, you know, 250 or 500 for sure. Um, and this is just another way to, to how we can help you. This is on our website as well. But yeah, typically for Leap, um, we have a webinar, I think later this week on our Venture Studio, but typically the companies that we bring in for Leap are doing revenue somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, 100 to 500K per year. Um, and we, we definitely have taken some that are earlier and we've taken some that are, have million dollars in, um, you know, millions of dollars in revenue. But our sweet spot is definitely product in market with traction with revenue. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best out of the program. Um, um, and, uh, um, and then the most common errors and problems uh, that we see when people are uh, going to investors, I think the biggest is not knowing the type of company you are. Are you a lifestyle company? Are you a single product company? Or are you really a scalable company that can provide a return on investment? You have to remember if you are looking for venture capital, you know, they are looking at a minimum, you know, 10, 10x return, you know, in, within five years, uh, of the capital they put in the company. So, you know, uh, uh, being realistic about the revenue that you can hit if you're taking in investors, investor money is, is important. Make sure your deck is, you know, 15 slides, like don't send decks that are, you know, 30 pages and filled with text, really high level stuff. Um, the lack of understanding of the stage you're at, similar to the type of company, the lack of understanding of your value prop or significantly overstating it, lack of understanding your your customer, underestimating the effort and resources required, um, failure to identify competition, a lack of competitive advantage, unproven team, inconsistent logics, logic or facts, and then over really optimistic financial projections. I think this last one is, is kind of, you know, I think everybody at an early stage has overly optimistic financial projections. I think the biggest question there is what are your assumptions and how are you um, using those assumptions to, um, inform your projections. Um, I think that's it on the slides. I think we can go to more questions and see we have a lot of talk happening. And does anybody want to share their experience with early stage funding or funding in general? Amanda, maybe? I'm calling on you right now. I'm happy to share. <laughs> so you're in, you're in Boston. How how did you how did you get connected to some of the angels there, and what was that like, and how long did it take? Um, so actually, Ben mentioned them. Uh, the Capital Network was a huge um, factor for me. Uh, they introduced me to a variety of 
different angels. They really taught me everything I needed to know, um, what I didn't know and how to make a pitch deck and what angels were looking for. Um, and then taught me how to pitch, um, which made a huge difference in talking to our, to the angels. And so that, I think that really helped, but it did take me probably a year from the time of having a pitch deck ready to actually getting any funding. And how many conversations do you think you had? Oh, um, lots and lots and lots. <laughs> what, 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 was oh, the average, what was the average check size? I'm just wondering, because you said a million. Was um, it so all? Actually, yeah, so small check sizes typical were uh, 15 to 20. Um, wow. Yeah, so that's been the only thing that's tough is that when you do go with the angels, is you're not getting huge amounts of, you know, there's several angels out there that will give you 50 to 75,000, but they're few and far between, at least in pet health. Yeah. Um, Thanks, but, Amanda. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, anybody else have questions? Or so Barbara says, this is a great list. However, how can you obtain mentorship so that you don't make the same mistakes? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think through thing like at least from a lead perspective we're, we're trying to create this programming and this network you know we have our slack channel isabel can can toss it in here um where you can connect with other entrepreneurs and mentors um i think as ben mentioned finding your local resources that every city has an entrepreneurship organization or whatever um and and tapping into those experts um uh and then you know we have office hours almost you know on a weekly basis that we can help you with um, uh, but I think, yeah, I, I think part of it is all, you know, when you find those investors, uh, you know, approaching them with advice, like, Hey, can you take a look at my deck and let me know, you know, what works and what doesn't work and get their advice and then go implement it and go back to them and say, Hey, what do you think? You know, like, it's a great way to build a relationship, um, for sure. Um, Yeah, Eric, uh, Eric in the in the Slack has been really great uh, ever since he's joined our community and offering his time and his his team's time. So appreciate that what you're saying, Eric, for sure. Uh, so to the the office yeah. hours, I had actually uh, reached out because I just wanted to touch base with you on on just catching up, uh, but I didn't know what the office hours. I didn't know how to book that. Oh, okay. I can send the link. It's okay. where I'm a little. Uh, I think because we opened up applications, it's been, I'm a little behind. I, I, have, no, I, have, I have no doubt, no doubt, <laughs> no, no doubt whatsoever. No, that wasn't meant to be, sound like a complaint. It was more just. No, no, totally. I and I, I, now that you out. say that, I, I remember seeing the email. So no worries. I'll, I'm trying to find my link right now. Yeah. And, and so um, also just, uh, we have events. Um, if you go to the lead venture studio .com, we have, we have public office hours that everybody can help each other. And then we have our info session later this week about the studio. And then I also hold, um, and Isabel also holds office hours as well. So um, just confirm. With both you and uh, Isabel on the line right now too, is, 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 I know that in the past, uh, the, um, the Venture Studio Accelerator program has been really geared more towards, oh, thanks by the way, sending that link, uh, but has been really geared towards, um, consumer focused service products and services with ha, has that perspective changed for this program? I know last, I know last year that was a primary focus. Um, but I don't want to waste my time applying if it's, if it's not applicable, if that's not what you're looking for, but you know, we've made some significant changes obviously in the world of COVID to help these businesses. And I was thinking that, you know, you guys might be more open to the B2B play this year. Sure. Yeah. I, I would say that, uh, definitely compared to years past, our focus has, I mean, I think it's both the same and, and changed. I think at least from a kinship perspective, you know, we are um, now focused a little bit more on products that are specifically helping pet parents become better parents, uh, pet parents. And so I think I, if, if I remember Pet Connect correctly, I think you're solving that issue. And so I think certainly you should apply. Um, I think we also just generally just look at good businesses in, in, pet, in the pet space that are um, uh, making a better world for pets. And so, you know, I think that if you are more on a, uh, have that traction and revenue and proof point, 
um, but aren't don't necessarily fall into our thesis. We're, we'll definitely take a serious look at you just because you know you you, you accomplish something. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Uh, it just I just didn't want to waste my time going through the application process if it wasn't you know if if I wasn't fitting the criteria essentially. Um, yeah. I, look, I, you know, I, I, I think that you, I think everything I know about you guys, you definitely fit that criteria. I, the other thing that I'll say is that we are going to, um, there's going to be a lot more different eyeballs looking at the applications this year compared right. to past years because we've had internal turnover and then also we're just bringing in a more diverse um, <clears throat> application committee to look at, at, at the applicants. So, you know, you know, I think that that is, uh, um, I don't know. I think that you'll just, it's a different set of eyeballs. And so you're, you know, yeah, but yeah. And it, that, that's all I needed to hear. So uh, yeah. I'll, I'll book some time on the uh, calendar just to catch up with you. And thank yeah, you. Thanks, that'd be great. thanks for answering the question. Appreciate it. Awesome. Totally. I mean, what I always tell startups is in the very least you get feedback from us on your application. And so if you have an hour to spend to do it, yep. but, to, you know, you, you'll get, you'll get yep. some sort of feedback. Yep. Um, <laughs> Eric, that's funny. Yeah, that's that. That'd be great <laughs> too. He he just became a new parent, so I don't think he'll he'll have a lot of time to to look at applications. What other questions, Ben? Any other thoughts on what people should be doing? You know, I think I think the la the, the the thing that's been swimming around my head that we haven't haven't really touched on is the sort of the relationship between investors and investees. And I think everyone's so keen on getting investment, they think they forget the other side of the table. Um, and I know that certainly as, as an investor, right, Learn Launch Accelerator, we have, uh, we have money, but sort of, <laughs> but we <laughs> we're in education, so nobody has money, but uh, maybe that's gonna change. Uh, um, but um, it's more, you know, I think that there are, what kind of investor are you looking for? Because I think the first check to fall in your lap maybe is not necessarily just because it comes to you doesn't mean you should take it. I know that sounds stupid. It's like, well, it's money. I'm going to build my company on it, so I should take it. But I really think people need to spend a little bit more time. And this is definitely a privileged perspective. Um, but it's worth a thought is, you know, who, are, who do you want to be your investors? Not just who do you, who do you fit, but who fits you? Um, and does, if you're bringing in angel investors, can they invest multiple times? Is their track record showing that they do invest multiple times when things are going well, right? If you uh, raise three hundred thousand dollars, and you bring in six angel investors. Like, which of those are happy to help bridge a, that round to the next round, right? Um, and I think there's just sort of understanding the economics and the the human sort of the, the humans behind the capital, as if they're from a fund, they need a return, and they have LPs that are expecting return, and so it's a very non-emotional decision. Angels mostly invest emotionally, um, not always, but most mostly. Um, uh, and so just thinking a little bit more about their, mo their motivations, because uh, it's not just straight up cash for a contract, like there's definitely just people behind that, those scenes. Um, and so what can, you, what can you glean from that and what kind of capital do you actually want? And especially in the early stages, if you're relying on believers to invest in your company when there isn't really revenue or their product isn't in market or whatever the problem, you know, whatever the sort of like the catch is, right? There's always something that's like, oh, you know, we're great except for these five things, right? Um, who's going to help you get there? Is it a, are they an investor and an advisor, right? Are they an investor and a mentor? Are they going to help open doors? And these are obvious things to think about, but I think we get so taken away by the lights of Vegas when we see dollars that we forget the, the rest of it. Um, and so it's just something to be aware of as you, as you go down the line and always ask those questions. Like, are we aligned, uh, you know, as, as humans, are we aligned in this business? That's, that's great, Ben. I, 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 just to build on that as well, a lot of times an angels will go and work for that company. I think Amanda probably knows that really well on this call. Uh, you know, they'll come in as COO and sometimes, sometimes angels are investing to see if, if, um, if they're a good fit for, you know, running the company. Maybe you move into a more product role because you're a better product or finance or, or whatever it is. And so, you know, that's also an option, you know, as you're, or, or something you should be discussing with potential investors as well, um, or could be discussed. I'd like to add one more, I make. Please. It, just be ready to get no as an answer, <laughs> both emotionally and, and passionately, and your idea. Like, there's, there's, there used to be a rule in venture capital before COVID, and it was like, contact 100 
VCs get 10 to maybe get one in 10. So maybe that's not the rule right now, but I would really suggest to founders, be ready uh, to not be demotivated when they tell you no. Remember, you are the ones who know better about your idea. Yeah, at this point, you're more likely to get to get total silence than to get a no. <laughs> Where we get reports from our from our friends that they're seeing twice the number of inbound comp companies coming and asking for time, um, and they just don't have the capacity, um, or I mean, or the fund dollars to to invest in twice as many companies. Um, there's a there's an upside down pyramid that shows the funnel for one of our one of our sort of friend investors, and they they talk about having a thousand a thousand conversations turn into two investments. Um, and they do that. They, they generally have a thousand conversations with potential companies and then they make two investments. Of course, that's a series A fund. Um, maybe it's three. It's a series A fund. So it's a little bit later. So it's very different, but that you're working with those kinds of numbers. Um, yeah. And the, the people, they talk to lots of people, but they also ignore lots of people. So it's a definitely a tough road. Yeah, I think just to put it in perspective for, for Leap, we'll probably end up talking or scouting about 200 companies to invest in seven, six or seven or eight companies um, for our program. Um, Eric so. just made a great comment in the chat, by the way, about, about what the no means. It's definitely worth thinking about. What does the no mean? What can you glean from it? Yeah. And sometimes investors are just jerks. So maybe there's nothing to <laughs> take away from it. That's the truth. That's the truth. Um, I want to uh, be cognizant that we're coming up to the end of the hour, but I can hang out for a little bit if people want to chat some more. And if you have to go, that's, that's totally cool. But um, uh, uh, I saw a question here. Scott said, when you raise money, it's common to declare the milestones you plan to reach. What types of milestones does Leap prioritize? I think for us, we really want to know what the milestones or what you want to get out of our program and how specifically the three partners, so MFA, Kinship, or Mars, and RGA Ventures can help you accomplish those goals. So, um, and this was similar to when Ben and I were running Learn Launch uh, Accelerators. It's like, if you if if you come to us and you want to um, tackle the North American market in uh, and your primary target audience is shelter and rescue, and you're having a design issue, like those are great. We can help you solve all those things. But if you are telling us that you want to tackle the Indian market and you know, whatever, you know, like we, we, we might not have the best resources for you to, to do that. Right. And so there might not be fit in that regard, but so yeah, really being clear about what your milestones are and you know, they're all going to change, but like, we want to understand whether or not, you know, what you're thinking, how you're thinking about it and whether, you know, um, what your three, six, 12, two year plans are and, and how we can be a part of that journey. Um, if I, I apologize, I don't know if we missed any questions because uh, I've, I've been going back and forth. Does, did anybody want to say something or? This was great. This was a great oh. session. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad that Ben could join. Otherwise, it would just Thank be very much. trembling. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I, I guess we'll say, like, definitely try to figure out where you are what type of company you are and who the best investors you are that you can approach. And, and I, I think lean heavily on fellow entrepreneurs because um, they're, they're trying to have the same conversations as you and, and likely, you know, uh, have had success uh, um, as well. And, and typically people are more collaborative in, in this uh, uh, industry than, than competitive. So. Um, if, if you're interested in, in, in Leap, you should definitely find a Leap alum and ask them questions about how awesome or not awesome Assad is or the value they got out of the program. We, we definitely get a lot of introductions from our, from our former alums to other, uh, to other companies. Um, and more often than not, if they're a good fit, that, that's sort of like a great stamp of approval. Um, so using, using as much of the network effect as possible for an accelerator specifically is key. Yeah. So I wanted to make a point, if you don't mind, Assad, this is Eric. Sure, Eric. Hi, Eric. Um, you know, as a multi-time uh, entrepreneur, I've been through this before. The pet industry absolutely needs this. There's really no, there's no tech stars that really applies to pet other than kinship and leave. So get in there. I mean, we're even talking about doing it, even though we consider ourselves kind of not wanting to kind of regress back through a lot of the things we would do with leap. We may not have a choice because without the championship of something like the leap 
and the, the academy, we may not get the de-risking and the sort of social proof that people need. Because I will tell you, after a year and a lot of my own money and my investor money, there's a lot of bad pet hardware. We have a hardware component. So we're coming up against a lot of bad investments in hardware. And that's proving to be a real challenge. It's not, not stopping us. It just means we're going orthogonal on the problem. But we may end up applying. We're still on the fence. No, no offense to anybody at Leap. We just thought that we'd be able to get to market faster on our own. And we may not be able to make it, COVID-19 or not. So don't hesitate. If you think you can be a fit, there is no other way in the pet industry that I've found that will give you signal to investors than this opportunity. So thank you very much, Assad, and to Michelson Found Foundation, Isabel, and, and RGA for it. We're, we're probably going to apply. We just have to suck it up and, and say maybe we have to be slower than we want. We're probably going to be slower than we want because COVID-19 has sucked the life out of everything, if you haven't noticed. So much slower. So that's all I wanted to make. Just don't put it off. I mean, if you were concerned about fitting, Maybe you won't fit if you're the only applicant, but maybe you fit in the whole portfolio when they come to select. You, you never Agreed. know. So and I, I, I will say to, to Eric that, that yeah. we are, we definitely need more cat companies in our portfolio and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that everything that Eric was saying is, is, is straight up. And it's for a better signal, Asad. There's just nothing right. out there that's going to do better. I don't think Agreed. we'll be able to raise big money without going through. The academy and that that's a that's a risk that i'm facing right now i hate to say it but it's it's a risk well there's definitely i mean we're, we're not the end all be all in pet care for sure <laughs> but uh um uh definitely we're one of the more active investors in, in this space but we're well, happy to to but as accelerators <laughs> go are there better accelerators for pet, <laughs> pet tech out there i don't think so yeah well i appreciate you saying that yeah. and as this it's all the work that isabel does so <laughs> um one thing i will say is that uh, you know, as, as people are leaving, I'm, uh, the best thing that you, you in order to r maintain the most control in your company and your idea, the best thing is to do is to bootstrap and, and um, you know, uh, as much as you can. Uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a great and viable path for a lot of people. Um, it's just a slower path. Um, and so, you know, and yeah. Any other questions? I don't think so. Anybody else on, on the call wanna say something or? I mean, I definitely join. Bad, I could talk about bad decisions for an hour. <laughs> that's another, that's definitely another <laughs> webinar for sure. Um, I definitely join the Slack channel and reach out to other founders and, um, and, and then also let Isabel and I know and, and Lauren here as well, how we can help you. You know, we, we do our best, you know, uh, to try to connect you all to, to the resources that you need. And um, um, yeah, I think, I think with that, we'll, we'll end it there. Ben, thank you so much again. Um, and you know me, I'm a, I'm a pet expert. Yeah. Do we have any pet ed tech companies out there? Maybe, maybe we can do a joint baby between our two programs. Lots of, lots of uh, healthcare education companies. M maybe, yeah, we'll, maybe we'll uh, change the world with a, a pet hybrid. Yeah, totally. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you.